So I warned John that my presentation or my talk is not really about enterprise development. So it, you know, you might find that you're in the wrong session here, but I believe that the others uh, fit in uh, and I'll try to make a, a connection somehow. Um, so the work I'm presenting uh, was done under one of uh, Union Wider's projects, uh, the one on structural transformation and inclusive growth in Vietnam. Um, right, so I realize my slides are somewhat packed, but that's because there are some photos and illustrations. So if you get fed up and bored, you can just look at the photos instead. Uh, so I want to, to start off by uh, talking a little bit about the current context to, to sort of uh, situate uh, the paper uh, within that. Um, and so this photo is from about half a year ago uh, and is one of many uh, images of uh, workers uh, protesting. Uh, here is the case of um, a Taiwanese footwear firm uh, where workers were striking against uh, um, the new salary system. So, uprisals against uh, changing employment relations. And last year, there were about 314 of these wildcat strikes. So, strikes that occur outside the legal framework, right? Um, and that has been uh, sort of, there's been waves of these strikes going on uh, for the past uh, 15 years or so. Uh, yeah, basically since 95, there's been more or less 6,000 strikes of these wildcat strikes occurring. And I believe that's uh, what well, is more than, than most other, than, than, than any other Asian economy. And it's also substantially more, I believe, than countries like South Africa that Lawrence will talk about uh, later on. Uh, so in 2011 was actually, if we look at this recent period, was uh, the peak year uh, for strikes. And we'll see in a minute the, the reasons uh, for these kind of changes in, uh, in, in workers' movements. So the question is, have these protests actually been uh, successful in any way? And recent work uh, by Mark Anna shows that in, in almost every case, at least one uh, of the, the workers' demands was, uh, was fulfilled. Um, and what we're seeing at the same time in Vietnam is that unionization is also on the rise, by contrast to most developed countries, of course. And so the question is, is there a link here? And if so, what is the role of these enterprise-based unions, which is what the focus of this uh, uh, work is on? And are they actually, do they have a role to play in ensure, ensuring gains for, for workers? So a lot of reasons uh, cited in the literature for why this, we've seen this increasing uh, number of strikes uh, in Vietnam, but also, of course, in China, in Indonesia and, and other countries. Uh, so the reasons range from uh, the, th the sort of more broader theoretical ones, like the capital labor relationship, the economy is opening, that's uh, leading to increased conflicts between labor and capital. Uh, quite a few authors cite, uh, in the case of Vietnam, the labor repressive styles of uh, mostly uh, local Asian uh, investors, South Koreans or Taiwanese, as we saw uh, before. Uh, then you have uh, these ideas of uh, social backlash against uh, the harsh working conditions. So that's kind of the more Polanyi type uh, worker unrest, if you want. Um, an example of that actually, as uh, I showed on the photo, is uh, what happened some years ago in 2000, 2015, where close to 100,000 workers protested against a change or a proposed change to social policy legislation. So the wildcat strikes are not just about employment relations and wages and so on. They're also sometimes at the level of uh, government changes. Um, I won't go into detail what happened, but maybe we can take that later on. Of course, the weak regulatory framework, uh, as also was alluded to in the keynote speech uh, this morning, and a lot of these emerging economies, you have very complex and sort of all-encompassing uh, legal frameworks that at the same time, that, that don't really represent who they're supposed to cover, right? Um, so that is, of course, also a, an, in, um, an incentive for workers to, to protest. The passive role of trade unions, I'll come back to that on the next slide, is often cited as, this, as the reason for these so-called collective bargaining by riots, right? Occurring outside uh, the regulations. 
And then, uh, of course, waves of high inflation, meaning that wages are uh, under pressure, and that, of course, uh, is a rational explanation for, for strikes. Uh, so just on that last point, uh, we can see here that there's quite a neat pattern between uh, inflation rates, uh, as illustrated by the gray line, and the, and the number of strikes. So that certainly is uh, a factor in why we're seeing uh, strikes. But basically, uh, there's a number of reasons cited. Um, OK, so where do these strikes mostly occur? It's mostly within foreign invested enterprises uh, in industrial zones, so particularly the garment sector. Uh, that is the most strike-prone sector in Vietnam, uh, an example being um, footwear, uh, industry. So this is a photo from uh, a Nike factory where just about over 10 years ago, a lot of workers walked out in protest of, of, uh, of um, low wages and poor working conditions. Um, strikes take place all over the country. There is some concentration in the south, though. Uh, and the majority of strikes take place in unionized firms. So, <clears throat> and just to give sort of that link uh, back uh, to the strikes, we know that union density varies across uh, the different sectors. And in FIEs, where the strikes are highest, it's around 60%, um, slightly lower in the private domestic sector. Union membership uh, is increasing all the time, uh, as I mentioned uh, initially. And actually, collective bargaining coverage is quite high in Vietnam, on paper. In effect, it, it's, a, it's a mere formality. It's actually just often the law that is kind of copied into the collective bargaining agreement without any consultation or proper sort of negotiations. <clears throat> and that is part of the issue. So what is so special about Vietnamese trade unions? And I know we have some uh, uh, people in the audience from Vietnam, so you might want to uh, comment or correct me on this later. Uh, but basically, because of economic transformation, uh, transformation going on in Vietnam, you would this would present an opportunity, right, for a growing private sector where you could have different kinds of or new labor relations being established, negotiations on the base of interests, right? So a change from the old system. But the challenge is that the, the higher trade level union, which is the Vietnamese um, General Confederation of Labor, is the only recognized trade union. And all local grassroots enterprise-based unions have to be affiliated to this. So... Uh, they're very limited in their kind of um, uh, ability to represent um, uh, represent their constituents. There's a there's this top-down approach. So basically, it's the high-level union that decides that now the enterprise should set up a union, and the leaders often are management or human resource uh, workers. So. Again, very, very weak in terms of being able to represent those, that, um, those whose interests they should reflect. Strikes are legally permitted, so this is different to in China. That doesn't mean that they're tolerated, because politically they're not tolerated. But they're, they're, they're legal if authorized by the upper level union. That doesn't happen very often, which is why you get the wildcat strikes. And the reason, um, or the revised union law from 2013, uh, also removed the right to, to, strike over, uh, to strike over rights. So, for example, unpaid overtime or occupational safety and health issues, you're allowed to strike over interests, but not rights. So, again, this leads to the question of how effective can enterprise-based unions actually be in representing uh, workers' rights or workers' interests, as it is. A lot of work, very difficult to summarize in, in one slide, and even here two packs. So just to say, some work has been done in South Africa, for example, uh, on this, and they see, uh, yes, there is a union wage gap, which is what most of the literature uh, shows, but some variation along the wage distribution depending on uh, where you are. In the case of Vietnam, the, most of the existing work is very in-depth, uh, qualitative case study based. Um, and then, Linking to the, to the, to the strike incidents, uh, there is some work that it seems to indicate that when uh, workers are actually uh, speaking to unions, asking them to represent them, it has um, 
even if the unions are kind of uh, incapable of, of, of doing much uh, on their own, you could say, they somehow are able to push for workers to have higher wages. So there's some in evidence that, yes, it, it may be possible for unions to, to act in workers' interests. But like I said, most of the work that's already there is qualitative or it uh, is econometrically limited in, times, in terms of being able to account for worker hatreds and heterogeneity and so on. Um, yeah. So, so this study, which is part of this union wider project, uh, uses um, or makes use of the, the Vietnamese SME survey that's been going on for, well, since 2002, I believe, or five, uh, with the last year being 2015. So it's a, it's a large uh, survey of small and medium enterprises. And for some of the years, there was also a survey done of the workers or a subsample of workers uh, in the firms. Um, so it's manufacturing firms from different sectors and different uh, legal uh, categories. And in this study, it's then uh, based on matching the firms to the workers. So around 1,600 full-time workers are part of the sample and more or less evenly distributed between the two years. So basically, I'm looking at 300 roughly firms uh, with the sample of workers. It's possible to, uh, to link the workers over time uh, so as to have a balanced panel of firms, uh, which then is slightly less, of course, than the total sample. Um, yeah, so SMEs, as we saw before, are not generally firms that are prone to, to having strikes. And when you look at the data, there's nothing on, on strikes, although it's part of the questions in the survey. Uh, so this is not a factor in the analysis, but the idea is to see whether these uh, indications of the fact that unions may play a role actually also transfers to SMEs, or is it only a case for the larger uh, foreign invested firms? I'm not sure time-wise. But... Okay. Right. So in terms of uh, a little bit about what the data says, um, Union density is very much uh, in line with the, with the national figures, so that's quite nice, 30-something uh, percent, increasing quite a bit over time. Um, and then when you restrict uh, the sample to only looking at firms that have unions, um, we see that union membership rate is about 80%, so it's voluntary right, to be part of a union. And the fact that you have f uh, workers within firms that are not union members actually means that it's possible to go a little bit more in depth with the analysis. Uh, I'll come back to that. Collective bargaining is relatively high, again, um, and this is obviously within firms that are unionized. Um, again, the figure is more or less the same as uh, the national level, but bear in mind, it doesn't really mean anything. Often it's ink on paper, uh, you would say. <clears throat> So I make use of the fact that there's a lot of uh, information and variables uh, in the survey that are available when you want to do an analysis of what determines wages, right? So I'm looking at union membership and does it mean anything in relation to wages? So obviously gender, hiring methods, your job function, these are all factors that also affect whether you become a union member or and whether you have wages of a certain level. So important to include. Um, one thing that's uh, quite nice for the analysis is that uh, the survey asks about what are the benefits of, of being a member of a union. And here we see that it's actually having uh, higher wages or stable, better and more stable wages. Yeah, it's 13% that, that say that's a, sort of a benefit of being a union, but it's not the main factor. So it doesn't seem that workers are selecting into unions uh, to have higher wages. Social benefits, yes. Uh, and previous work showed that, yes, being a union member, so controlling for all other factors, is substantially correlated with having a better provision of, uh, of social benefits. But the fact that wages is not a major factor is, is kind of... Uh, uh, comforting. So uh, the only equation here 
is just to show the model in, in estimating the union wage gap. Um, and that's basically the individual wage outcome, depending on worker characteristics, which are all um, specified above, firm characteristics, uh, and then, of course, whether you're a union member or not, right? So that is a kind of standard model of, of determining whether there's a, a wage premium. I uh, won't go into the methods, but basically just to say that I try to use all kinds of techniques to, to say that this is the, the pure effect of union membership and it's not capturing uh, something else. Uh, so basically, matching to compare workers that became union member to those that didn't over the time period, and so on, and also instrumental variable um, technique. So what the results show is that, yeah, there's a union uh, wage gap. Uh, it ranges from about 10 to 20%, depending on what specification it is and, uh, and what approach is taken of the ones I, I, I showed on the previous slide. When doing quantile regressions, it is revealed that actually the wage premium increases as you go up the, the wage distribution. So that is um, similar to, uh, to some studies uh, by, for example, David Card and uh, Rika, uh, but, all, but they differ, for instance, from studies in South Africa and Ghana, where you find it's the opposite. It's more of a flattening effect, right? Uh, so that it's higher for the lower end of the wage distribution. Um, <clears throat> when just restricting the sample to, to firms that are unionized and making the fact of the use that, that there are workers that are not members of the, the firm level union, uh, the, the union wage gate is 10%. So that's in line with the, with, the, with the overall or with the general results. And what it shows is that being a union member is a, it's a direct effect. It's not a spillover effect, right? Because then otherwise all workers, there wouldn't be a gap. All workers would have uh, a benefit from being a union member. And I think that's, uh, yeah, not really surprising given that the collective bargaining agreements and methods are, are quite weak, right? So if they were stronger, you would probably see more of a, a spillover within the firm. Um, and also some further checks to see if there's any sort of repercussions or knock-on effects on the informal sector shows that there's not. So to some extent, labor market segmentation. Uh, so, so being located in an area where there's a certain concentration of unions do, and if you're not in a unionized or you're in an informal sector, it doesn't mean that your wage will be boosted. Um, yeah. So just to sum up, uh, it does pay off to be a union, a union member uh, in, a, in a firm with unions, but the effect is stronger for the more skilled workers, right? So um, what are the implications? Yes, it seems that there is a widening of the skills gap uh, going on to some extent. Um, and the only way to sort, or one of the main ways to counter that, obviously, is to to make the collective bargaining and agreements more uh, based on negotiations and real discussions, and not just being transferred directly from what's written on the law. Uh, so, um, in fact, the revised labor code, so it's not so new anymore, w did extend the right of collective bargaining to be sort of rolled out to non-union workers. Uh, but as also discussed this morning in the opening session, it, it doesn't really mean anything if it's not enforced in practice, right? It's, it's just the legal framework. There's been some, uh, well, quite a bit of progress, actually, in terms of sectoral level bargaining, especially in garments, also in rubber, and the other sectors uh, are coming up. And increasing, um, increasing pressure, actually, on the, on the VGCL has also meant that in recent years they've started looking into more uh, the quality of the collective bargaining and agreements. Um, and, and yeah, basically doing some evaluations of how they can be more uh, reflecting proper negotiations and not just sort of copied from, from the legal framework. But I think still the estimates are that 56% of bargaining agreements are actually just uh, yeah, pure copies without any extra additions from workers' demands. I have zero minutes left. So just to, to yeah, uh, to, to finalize and to say, okay, where are we going from here? You all know that the, the, the TPP, uh, the 
trans-Pacific partnership agreement, of course, doesn't exist anymore, but its follower, which I'm not going to spell out, uh, of course, might present an opportunity along with the, with the Vietnam-EU uh, free trade area, which is, I think, taking effect uh, or should take effect next year. There, there are extensive labor rights commitments made from Vietnam. So the question is, will this push even more for a reform uh, of the union system and revisions to the labor court <coughs> in terms of freedom of association and collective bargaining and so on? So that remains to be seen. Next year, they're presenting the, the new draft labor law to the National Assembly. And again, it remains to be seen whether some of these um, sort of uh, initiatives towards improving the labor relations situations will be part of that. Uh, yeah. End of story. Oh, maybe just, okay, so just until we have the next presenter, I can just, uh, I found this cartoon funny, but this is to link to the free trade area. I mean, the free trade agreements coming up. Uh, yeah, but basically you could maybe, I mean, there's no Vietnamese worker, but I mean, you can imagine uh, that, yeah. So just to say that it should have positive implications, but we also know what free trade agreements may do. Thank you.